All right, I think we're ready to begin. My name is Clark Murdoch. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS. Um, I have to say I hadn't realized the extent to which the talk by the Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, would set up this panel. Uh, there is a temptation to say uh, to my colleagues here, well, we've heard from the Deputy Secretary, Bob Work says, stop the madness. Um, uh, my compatriot and former colleague from the Air Force, Bob Hale, will undoubtedly say, stop the madness. And then the four, three appropriating staffers, the former, can say, this is how we'll stop the madness during that time, because somebody always has to impose discipline <laughs> on the process. Anyway, uh, it's with great pleasure that, uh, that I preside over this. This is something that David Berteau did last year. Uh, to quite some success, and although I pleaded with my bosses to let them do it again, they decided that they didn't want such a success, so I've been asked to, uh, uh, to speak in for them. Fortunately, I have the crutch of uh, Bob Work's uh, introductory speech uh, to build on during this time. I have a few charts that I would like to uh, present just to put into context, uh, although I have to say that the uh, Deputy Secretary did a good job, so I'll be blessedly short. Uh, first slide, a comparison of past drawdowns. Uh, this happens to be a slide that both David and I use. It's one of the most widely requested slides from CSIS. And it makes a, a very visual presentation of why this buildup is different than past buildups. In past buildups, particularly after Korea and Vietnam, huge increase in active duty personnel and the numbers and the amount being paid to them. Not as true during the post-Cold War buildup and not at all true during the post-9-11 buildup. What you see is that we spent lots more dollars, but the dollars were all on civilian pay, all on contractors, and all on active duty pay for reserve components called to active duty. And that the actual number of active duty personnel in the force only increased modestly, maybe a couple of percent during the buildup. And the downturn, the, the cut back, while it looks the same as previous build downs, defense drawdowns, it is only going down to a base level of $520 billion in FY13 dollars. Previous buildups always went down to about $400 billion. So we are going down to uh, a smaller force that costs us over $100 billion more per year in real dollars. Next slide. This is a, uh, uh, an argument that uh, we've been making for about a year and a half, two years at uh, CSIS as part of a defense drawdown, affordable military study that Ryan Crotty and I have been working on during this time, but it's to talk about the double whammy that's hitting the budget. It's not just fewer dollars, which is defense drawdown, it is also weaker dollars in terms of the purchasing power of the defense dollar. Uh, as we estimated, um, uh, the drawdown, and we dated from 2012, which was the peak base budget year uh, during the post 9-11 buildup, we are having a decrease of about 21% in terms of the total amount of dollars available. At the same time, and this was something that uh, the Secretary of Work pointed out, is that the building is experiencing, the Pentagon is experiencing cost growth above inflation. And uh, I, was I was horrified to notice that he cited a RAND study uh, rather than a CSIS study. RAND estimated 1% per year. We estimate 1.5% per year in terms of internal cost growth above inflation. But this is hollowing out the budget uh, from within. At the same time, the defense budget is being drawn down. We estimate that based upon 1.5% per year uh, at 15% over uh, the defense drawdown period under the Budget Control Act. Next slide. Or perhaps not. Next slide. Well, I've already failed the David Berteau test. We can see it. Talk to that. 
<laughs> All right, I think we're, we're ready to come back again. Uh, we need to get to the third slide of a four-slide brief, <laughs> which seems to be going on much longer than I intended. Okay. Let's go to the last slide, the approaching capacity crisis. This is a, I feel that we face, and we have not internalized yet, how much less capacity we're going to be able to abide, to afford within FY 2021 at the end of the Budget Control Act in terms of the amount of dollars available. One vivid particular, we took the FY 2012 budget for structure and its modernization profile as the last pre-drawdown year, and that estimated that that would cost in 2013 dollars $660 billion. In order to afford that same force in 2013, I mean in, in FY 2021, the last year under the Budget Control Act, that would require $757 billion, again in FY 13 dollars. Yet the Budget Control Act only gives you $520 billion in FY13 dollars. So we're talking about, in terms of a gap, between how much it costs uh, to sustain the current force, we're talking about over $200 billion in the FY2021 time period. Uh, just two quotes on that. Very experienced former defense official has said recently, talking about the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance, which as Secretary Work pointed out, was what they thought they had equated in the FY13 budget request, where dollars met the strategy, that the DSG, oh, that was $100 billion a year ago. You know, we can't afford that now. Uh, in a Budget Control Act capped world, I believe the question we have to ask is essentially how much strategy can we afford? Because we are in a budget capped environment. Uh, with that as a setup, but really with Secretary Work's uh, presentation as a setup, we'll turn again to a former administration official before we turn to the former Appropriations Staff Committee members, Bob Hale. Clark, thank you. You all hear me back there? All right. Glad to see standing room audience here. This is good, although there are some seats, if you don't mind. This is church seating. There are a few seats up here, if you want. So thank you for the chance to be here today to talk about what Clark has titled sequestration and the politics of the defense budget. In my time this morning, and I'll try to keep it to my 10 minutes, I want to make two broad points. First, I believe DOD needs more funding than is available in the Budget Control Act. I realize it'll be a tough political lift. My folks to the left can talk about that, but I don't think an impossible one. And second, DOD owes it to the American public to make hard choices about how we stretch those defense dollars no matter how many dollars uh, are, uh, are available. And, I'm, and I might add, for those of you who heard Bob work, uh, I'll underscore a number of his points. Let me turn to that first point. I believe DOD needs added funding above the Budget Control Act. Under the BCA, DOD in fiscal year 16 would receive $500 billion. It was another year of modest real decline. It would be the sixth in a row for the base budget. And in the years beyond fiscal 16, under the Budget Control Act, it would grow at about the rate of inflation. So it would essentially go down again and then stay flat. I think the President's proposal from last year uh, for uh, the next few years is more appropriate. $535 billion in fiscal 16 would be about a 5% real growth. Um, which would begin to offset uh, or help the department offset some of the problems and readiness and others that Bob uh, outlined this morning. And growth beyond fiscal 16 under that plan modest, but close to staying uh, a pace with inflation. Now, your first reaction may be, Recommending higher funding is just uh, uh, a former DOD comptroller displaying his genetic impulse toward getting more budget uh, for the Department of Defense. And there may be some truth uh, to that reaction. But I believe there are more defensible reasons uh, for arguing that the department needs more funding. Ultimately, defense has got to balance monies for DOD, which increase the deficit, against the threat of not fulfilling the national security strategy. And Bob did a good, how many of you heard Bob work this morning? 
All right, most of you. Um, so I'll paraphrase. He did a good job of going through that list of national security threats. He called them striking. I think that's probably a pretty good word. Obviously, ISIS has got all the front page news now in Syria and Iran. We're still finishing a war in Afghanistan. It won't be done for a couple of months. We'll leave around 10,000 troops there, so there'll be a fair amount to go still in, uh, in Afghanistan, I should say, uh, in Afghanistan. Iran mains, remains a concern. Uh, uh, we don't seem to have a deal with them yet. It's not clear where that's heading, heightened by our, uh, that concern heightened by our commitment to Israel. We don't envision a military involvement in Ukraine, but we clearly want a strong military as a deterrent there. And let's not forget North Korea. It's been forced off the front pages, uh, uh, but it's a rogue nation is unpredictable, even while we have several tens of thousands of troops in South Korea. And of course, there's China seemingly intent on expanding its presence in the Pacific and creating much concern among our allies. To me, these threats seem considerable. To me, they suggest an increase in the need, uh, a need for increased <coughs> defense spending. Now, even if you accept my premise that the department needs funding uh, above the BCA, you might say there's no way that Congress will change the BCA to increase defense funding. And I might add that at least while President Obama is in office, any change that gets defense more, I think, will have to be accompanied by a change that increases non-defense spending. I've heard him say personally and with conviction uh, that he believes there are unmet non-defense needs as well uh, and that he won't accept simply incre a simple increase in defense. That's going to complicate the political lift. Well, I understand amending the BCA is a heavy political lift. I don't think it is insurmountable. Congress has changed the BCA twice in late 2013, uh, 12, I should say, and again in 2013, the Murray Ryan deal. Both times they modestly increased both defense uh, funding and non defense funding. History also suggests at least some possibility of, uh, of increases. You saw Clark's chart. The, the defense budget is notoriously cyclical. If you look at it in real terms, it looks like a roller coaster, up, down, up, down. We are in the fifth consecutive year in real decline, a real decline in the total defense budget, and it's actually including the uh, wartime OCO spending. It's actually also the fifth consecutive year of decline in the uh, base budget as well, although the base budget declines have been modest. So you've, we've seen some decline, uh, around 20, 25 percent in the total budget. Uh, if history is a guide, we may be nearing a turning point. Any increase in defense funding would have to be part of another mini deal, a uh, budget deal, along the lines of the Ryan Murray deal uh, in 2013. Congress tends to work difficult issues like that one, uh, that one, only if there is an action forcing event. But next year, there may be such an action forcing event. The government will again hit the debt ceiling, not clear when, could be the spring, although with the economy performing the way it is, I could see it being considerably later. Uh, but the debt ceiling is going to have to be increased, and it may be the action forcing event that causes another deal. Well, I think it's possible there will be some modest increase in defense funding. It is by no means certain. And if the increases don't occur, then I expect DOD will generally follow the blueprint the department laid out last fall uh, for operating under sequester level or BCA budgets. That blueprint calls for sharper cuts in, in ground forces down to 420,000 in the Army, 170,000 in the Marines, slowing numerous defense weapons programs, but the big ones tend to be slowed less. The real cuts, if you look at that blueprint, occur in the smaller weapons programs, particularly other procurement and uh, and Army ammunition. Sharp and probably unsustainable cuts in support activities like military construction. We're already in this budget at ridiculously low levels of mil military construction. You can keep it up for a while, but eventually we'll do what we did in the 90s and build up a, uh, a backlog that will have to be met. Overall, I think these changes would lead to greater risk of not fulfilling national security requirements. And in this world environment, I don't think that'd be a smart decision. Now, while I believe the defense funding needs to be increased by the levels of the BCA caps. I believe with equal conviction that the department owes the public every effort to hold down defense funding needs. That effort will require hard decisions in DOD, but also in the United States Congress. And let me turn to that topic in my remaining time. Now, are those, there are those who are convinced that DOD is full of, uh, of waste and, uh, and duplication with a bit of fraud tossed in for good measure. Uh, cynics have said that DOD wastes more money before uh, lunch than most departments spend in a year. 
There is most assuredly some waste and duplication in the DOD budget and unfortunately some fraud as well. But there's no budget line item for those things. There's no simple way to identify them. And one person's duplication may be another person's choice for a way to reduce risk. So in my experience managing a, now more than a decade at senior levels in DOD, it is not helpful to make sweeping generalizations about waste and fraud. What you gotta do, the only successful approach, is to identify specific changes aimed at reducing waste or more typically at finding and eliminating lower priority programs. One can then have the debate about whether it's truly lower priority and one can begin to build a consensus, both in DOD, which is often a challenge, and in the Congress to make lasting change. So let me follow this approach and identify a few specific changes, although I'll not spend too much time on them. When you do this, as a former comptroller or anybody doing it, uh, you're not exactly greeted warmly in the Department of Defense. I used to say that the motto in the comptroller shop is, uh, we're not happy until you're not happy. And there's certainly <laughs> some truth to that when you, uh, when you pursue uh, items like this. First, I should say, though, there's been some success. DOD has slowed health care cost growth, primarily through provider costs, slowing uh, using uh, VA drug pricing schemes, Medicare rates for outpatient uh, pharmaceutical copay increases and modest increases in fees for retirees. Slowed compensation by at least holding down pay raises uh, in this last year, cutbacks in headquarters personnel, and overall cutbacks in civilian personnel, some of which at least were based on process changes. We've gotten some of the low-hanging fruit, it'll get tougher, but the single biggest way to reduce defense funding without, funding without harming mission is to get rid of unneeded infrastructure. Now, those of you that heard Bob work, he spent some time on this, so I'm not gonna repeat it. Basically, we need base realignment. We, the Department of Defense, needs base realignment uh, and uh, closure authority. It's, it's difficult in the Department of Defense. Not all the services agree, I might add, on the need for this. And it's poisonous for the Congress because BRAC concentrates the political problems. It closes a base in a particular state or district. And even though history makes it clear that almost all these communities recover, many of them prosper uh, a few years after the closures. Nonetheless, no member of Congress wants to have a base closed in his or her <laughs> district. The UD has asked for BRAC authority twice. Uh, I hope they'll do so again, but I think the only way they'll get it at this point is for the president to threaten to veto the authorization bill if it isn't included, and I'm not too confident in this environment that that's gonna happen. But if they don't provide the authority, we're wasting billions of taxpayer dollars. Uh, Bob Works numbers, uh, uh, two to three billion dollars a year in, in likely savings from another background are, are about right. Military health care costs are another area that deserve attention. The UD has made some good proposals, in my view, on the benefits side. Congress isn't going to act on them this year. I hope that next year they will. They in, involve uh, uh, modest increases in co-pays, which will limit the use of uh, unnecessary use of, of, uh, of health care. DOD, in turn, needs to summon up the courage to reduce or close military treatment facilities to eliminate the very substantial underutilization. We tried while I was there. We didn't get very far. Maybe it's time for a change of incentives, perhaps creating a working capital fund uh, for, for, to pay for the military treatment facilities to put the money back in the hands of the services because right now I don't believe they think that if they actually make these painful choices and close a facility, they'll get to spend the savings. The Working Capital Fund might help change those incentives. Legislative proposals are pending uh, for a lot of these changes, including military compensation, which I'm not gonna go through now. I hope that in the aftermath of the election, Congress will at least grant some of those changes. So of course, there are many other ways to hold down costs, eliminate ignore priority contractual activities is an example. Uh, I especially applaud the Navy's effort in this regard. Navy established a contract court, senior group led by the vice chief, uh, former VCNO, that reviews contracts for relevancy. I say this with a little bit of concern since I've just gone to work for Booz Allen Hamilton, a major contractor, but nonetheless, it's something the Department of Defense uh, needs to do. And there are other ways to do this. My time has expired. So let me say in sum, there are opportunities to get more out of defense dollars. Opportunities require courage on the part both the Department of Defense and the United States Congress. These actions alone will not, in my view, provide the resources needed to meet high levels of threats. We need to add defense funding, increased defense funding above the BCA levels while also stretching every dollar just as much as we can. So with that, I'll stop. Turn Thank it back you, over Bob. to Clark. Jim. Uh, thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Clark, and good morning, everyone. 
Following Bob Hale, I'm reminded of the words of the late, great Morris K. Udall, who said, it's all been said before, but not by everyone. So here we go. Um, I also am reminded that this is uh, not the first time we've done this, especially here at CSIS. Uh, we've been here before. Uh, we met and we said to ourselves, oh, this can't happen. Uh, it shouldn't happen. And then, God forbid, it happened. And uh, we all know what a bad thing that was. I remember something else about the last time, and I want to pay public tribute to uh, Mr. Hale here for a moment. John Henry led off our last discussion by saying something that stuck with me, and what he said was that defense can handle something like this. This was a threat that of all of the federal agencies, defense had the smart guys, the resources, and the ability to do things that would conceivably weather a sequester. I thought it was a tribute to uh, Mr. Hale's fiduciary skills. Uh, and indeed, what John said was both a blessing and a curse in my eyes because we all knew it was a bad thing, and the numbers that fell from it were pretty bad numbers in terms of lost productivity and lost wages and lost everything. But the reality was we survived it. And what it did, I think, in this town was build up a level of immunity where there are certain people, especially in the political sphere, who say, oh, hey, we can survive this thing. I think going forward this year, that's one of the things that, that, that those of us who think this is a bad idea are going to have to combat. Uh, Bob talked about Ryan Murray. Ryan Murray was a two-year painkiller. It's wearing off this year. It's off the table. And we're preparing to face life without Ryan Murray, which means that a nation like ours, embroiled in a series of foreign policy and defense threats, will wrestle with the questions about whether or not its resources should arbitrarily be sliced and diced at the same time. I think all of us in here will submit that that's not a very good thing. Now, it's not going to take us terribly long to figure out how this will play out, because one of the interesting aspects of the new Congress is that there is a lot to do. Um, and you've now seen, one week after election, a certain dichotomy in the press where there is a body of thought that says, oh, this is going to be a continuation of the last Congress where the legislative executive struggle is going to highlight their activities. There's another body of thought that says, with a change, especially in the Senate, there is an opportunity to do some productive work. The president's budget's due in early February. The debt ceiling has got to be adjusted at the earliest, probably around the 15th of March. The so-called doc fix that we, re we wrestle with year after weary year to the, to the concern of my doctor, and I know yours, uh, also expires at that time. We should see a congressional budget in April. We should see how serious this Congress is going to be with regard to something it hasn't done in a multiplicity of years, and that is <clears throat> to implement the reconciliation tool available to it to cut spending on the mandatory side. If and when it can do that, hopefully appropriators will get a decent number, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Then we have to worry about the fact that the highway bill, the nation's largest infrastructure bill, expires in May. And then in June, the XM Bank, another uh, critical piece of our economy, uh, the authority there will expire. And after an appropriate recess and a rest in the summertime, we have to come back and worry about whether or not the nation's aviation's program, aviation programs can continue. Now, that's just the snapshot. There's a lot else going on out there, but my point to you is there are a number of significant milestones that this Congress is going to have to address in the first six-month period. Their success in addressing these milestones, I think, will give us some kind of an indicator about whether or not this Congress would be able to move and do something about spending caps. Let me suggest to you that we are about to enter year six of what was basically an 11-year budget deal, as outlined in the 2011 Budget Control Act. I would ask you for a moment to set aside the, partner, the, the, the partisanship, and I would ask you to set aside the outside noise, take a deep breath, and ask yourselves a simple question. Wouldn't prudent people, six years into an 11-year budget deal, 
where numbers are basically projections, especially the out near numbers, wouldn't prudent people take a step back and say, are these numbers adequate to meeting our national needs, not just in defense, but in non-defense as well? I hope that's the case. Now, there are those of you in the audience, I'm sure, and, and in this town who will say, wait a minute, are you calling for a relaxation in our drive to cut spending? And the answer is no. And I can say that with comfort because virtually every think tank, every budget organization, every thoughtful budget person in this town will advance the notion that this type of restraint does not materially contribute to reducing our national debt. Indeed, it, it, may, be, it may impede those reductions. For those of you who worry about long-term debt, and you should because it's a long-term huge problem, but the solution to that is really not over in, it's not in our world. It's over in the world of mandatory spending and it's over in the world of a, the potential for a possible revision of the tax code, which actually most of us will, real, will, will concede needs to happen, but conceding its, its importance is a long way from actually making it happen. Now, if you look at the FY16 BCC caps, you'll notice they're up a little bit. Uh, there's a slight increase for defense and non-defense, and I, most of us would argue that's not enough. Uh, if we were forced into a sequester, we would basically be flatlining Ryan Murray. We'd be basically extending it for another year. And I don't even think uh, Congressman Ryan and Senator Murray want to do that. Yet if we factor into the mix, we're also, as Bob mentioned, we're cutting constant dollars below where we have been for the last several years. There are multiple studies on multiple fronts, including a very good one by this institution that talks about the casualties of a sequester budget. Personnel cuts, or structure cuts, big ticket long-term investments, problems with the Navy projecting power. That's a few of them. So we have uh, the right to ask ourselves, now that we've identified the problem, what do you want to do about it? Um, this Congress is about two months away from reconvening, and defense advocates across the town are advocating lifting the discretionary caps for defense only. <clears throat> I want to remind everybody that the Congress tried that a couple of years ago, and they did it very late in the year, and the initiative died. I believe, based on my reading of the Congress, that such an initiative would die again this year. I would suggest to you that we need a more comprehensive approach. Consistent with post-election promises, I hope that we can reintroduce the, the, the tool of reconciliation back into the system to cut mandatory spending. I made some calls yesterday to some friends of mine far more knowledgeable on budget issues than I am, and I asked them, when was the last time the Congress effectively advanced the tool of reconciliation to control mandatory spending, and they couldn't remember. There was no concrete answer out there. So it's been a long time, but that does not mean it's not a valuable tool in going forward. Um, it's, the other point I would make to you is that if we're going to take a serious look at reconciliation, if we're going to take a serious look at changing the tax code, hopefully with the notion of providing more revenue to the system, this, these two actions of themselves would conceivably give us some room to revise the discretionary caps upward. Again, not just for defense, but for non-defense. Let me make a, give you a couple of reasons why we ought to consider that. We're coming out of the Ebola scare, mercifully. Uh, the whole incident has brought into question the adequacies of funding, not only at the NIH, but at the Center for Disease Control. Now, some of my budget friends will say, Jim, this is a one-off deal. We can handle this thing and move on. And they may be right, but they may not be right. And the issue is a very delicate one, and it's something that budget planners ought to consider. They ought to consider the fact that we've cut the National Institute of Health budget well over 20 percent in adjusted dollars since 2010. The court systems, we've cut them by almost 15 percent over the same time frame. The bureaucratic wrongs that the Veterans Administration are going to cost a lot of money to fix, and you have seen this year that the Congress has moved and provided the money. We don't even know if it's enough, but they provided the money to try to do that. And 
And this is an interesting uh, uh, quandary for me because I've asked the question repeatedly over the course of the past several years, can anybody tell me how much it would take to secure our borders? I don't think that answer is out there because we have a difficult time among ourselves defining what border security is. We think we know the elements of it, but we simply don't know the cost of it. And I would submit to you that these things, in addition to the needs of the Pentagon, cry out for a serious review. And if we're going to review defense spending, we ought to review them as well. I would hope a new budget committee in the House and the Senate with new budget chairman, perhaps new membership, and perhaps some new ideas, which I would urge all of you to funnel into the system, might take a serious look at the efficacy of the current caps. If we could get real-time workable discretionary caps, we could do a lot of good things. We could give the Pentagon the relief it seeks. We could boost the economy by infusing infrastructure spending, hopefully. We could take care of our veterans, and we can do some good stuff. Um, but we would need the type of commitment from both sides, from both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue that has been sadly lacking over the course of the past six to eight to ten years. I would add one or two other little things related to sequestration that I also hope could happen this year. I think this Pentagon and indeed everybody else in this town spends too much time living under continuing resolutions. These little devices some years ago were designed to give our old committee the opportunity to complete its bills. But the continuing resolution has somehow in this town become a law unto itself. It handicaps program managers and policy planners in and out of the Pentagon at every turn. It's not just a matter now of one or two or 10 or 20 days. It's a matter of well over 100 days. And in, in, indeed, there is a significant body of thought on Capitol Hill today who says, oh, let's run it out for an entire year. Well, my response to that is, well, why, why bother? Why, why do we even have an appropriations process if, we were gonna, if we're going to lock agencies like the Pentagon into spending all money on all priorities without getting fresh money and a fresh look at its ongoing needs? We need tighter CRs. We need back to go back to two, three, six, five, ten day CRs. If for no other reason, then we put pressure on the system. We put pressure on our old committee. We put pressure on a Congress. We put pressure on a White House to try to tighten this thing up and basically refresh and, and, and give the system the jolt of money it needs and to keep the government away from what are basically a series of outmoded and outdated conditions. I think that would be a worthy goal. Finally, let me say something about OCO, if I might. Um, OCO is not a substitute for real-time budget cap reform. And, and I'll, I'll take the public pledge here, because some years ago, in its, infantry, in its infant, infancy, there may have been some of us who thought we could put some base budget funding in the OCO accounts and may have been proud of ourselves uh, after that was over with. I, I'm not owning up to it. I'm just saying that may have happened. <laughs> But I think the Congress is going to tighten up its look at OCO because OCO's gotten so much visibility and because it's off budget and because there is still a call in this land for transparency. If we want real numbers under a real budget, not numbers hidden under a rubric of emergency spending, we're going to recognize OCO for what it is and the importance that is placed on it, but it is not a substitute in any way for a revision of the basic discretionary caps. Um, back to John Hammy's admonition of a year ago, uh, not only is the threat very real, and, and the Pentagon is it full of shrewd people, and as most of them are sitting here tonight, at least the formers, but, but we have got to get ourselves in a situation this year where we recognize that this is bad public policy. Indeed, I would remind you that the man who wrote the original sequestration law, former Senator Phil Graham, said, heck, he never intended for the thing to become law. So I would hope that we would use our voice, our political influence, and our energies to get this Congress and this White House to do the right thing this year, which is to step up to the plate, look at these caps, 
And it's not just the two, uh, 2016 caps, it's the runout caps through the balance of the deal. These things need to be looked at, worked at, and revised. And if we can do these things, I think we could put this threat of sequestration behind us. Failing that, I would urge all of us to clear our calendars because we're probably going to be right back here again a year from now and we're going to be worrying about the same thing. Thank you. All right. As a former authorizer, I was thinking you sounded too much like an authorizer at the beginning, but you managed to come back to your passionate attacks on CRs and OCOs, uh, the appropriator's mantle. Sid. Thank you. I like to think about the Budget Control Act really in context of the, of the choices that brought us to this point. And if you think back to 2011, it was the inability of the Congress and the White House to come up with a plan to reduce deficit spending. So the Budget Control Act was crafted to provide some choices to deal with that. And as we all know, it did not work, and it forced the administration and the Congress to decide, all right, then we're going to be stuck with this and we're going to move forward. What that then subsequently forced, not just the Department of Defense, but all of domestic agencies to how to, the choices to how to live within sequestration. And as we all know, the DOD budget is comprised of things that are easy to cut and things that are not easy to cut. Of course, the things that are easy to get to are such things as you can cut modernization, and you can slim back readiness. Things that are harder to do are people, infrastructure, healthcare, and obviously compensation. So we've seen that in a constrained budget environment, the departments reduce spending in the areas that are easy to get to. For example, spending on modernization in, uh, has declined significantly greater than in other areas. In constant dollars, the average overall budget has declined about 34% since 2008 while the modernization budget has uh, reduced by 44% in that same time frame. DOD has tried to make changes in such areas, and Bob alluded to those as well as Jim, um, such as health care, BRAC, and uh, pay and benefits without much success. Budget pressures are further complicated by increasing costs associated with health care and compensation, which continue to consume a greater portion of the budget each and every year, the shrinking budget. <clears throat> One choice the department doesn't have is how they respond to global conflicts and global threats. So since the BCA was enacted almost three years ago, the global national security environment has certainly become much more turbulent, and U.S. commitments around the world have increased. So the department is being asked to do more with less but isn't allowed to make the structural changes they need to make in order to um, alleviate some of that pressure. And that's only going to get worse. And, and another point that's really important to remember as we lead into 2015, the same budget conditions that were present in 2011, 2010, 2011, are still there. Nothing has changed with regards to the deficit. So, we have to think about, if we couldn't solve it in 2010, how do we expect to change it in 2015, even with a Republican Congress and a divided government? So meanwhile, industry has had to make some hard choices. They're doing such things as reduce, reducing inventory, shrinking infrastructure, letting go people, um, cost, all kinds and measures of cost-saving measures. We have also stopped investing in research and development. And if you look at, over the past decade, R&D spending as a percent of sales for major defense contractors has declined 30%. So we're seeing defense companies choosing to focus on the areas of, of spending that they can and really focus on core competencies where they see more opportunity. For example, we've seen many high profile acquisition pursuits where we only have one bidder. That's really somewhat remarkable, such as the combat rescue helicopter. Only 45% of defense contracts over the past two years were awarded competitively. Think about that, only less than half. And many competitive awards only received one bidder. We've also seen many suppliers exiting the defense business. 
altogether, choosing the more uh, lucrative commercial markets. The Congress has many choices ahead of it as well. In light of increasing challenges around the world, they've called on Congress to remove or lift the Budget Control Act. DOD has asked Congress to allow reforms that would allow them to uh, alleviate some of the budget pressures, such as BRAC and compensation reform. Instead, Congress is making the easiest political decisions, which is not to address the problem and deny all reform proposals or to delay those to some future Congress. In fact, many in Congress do not see a problem with sequestration at all. Since the BCA was enacted, the deficit is down considerably, and the economy has, in some part, recovered. The combination of continued spending caps, increasing costs for health care, et cetera, and increasing global demands will lead to significant consequences to defense capability and affordability. Defense R&D has declined substantially and will continue to fall. As a percent of GDP, defense R&D has, has fallen from 1% in the 1960s to 0.7% in the 1980s to 0.5% in the last decade. Defense R&D is expected to continue to decline to about 0.3% by the end of this decade. Similar spending on R&D and less industrial competition will allow advances in technology, will slow the advances in technology in the U.S. and that relied on military superiority since World War II. Under Secretary Kendall, often highlights that technological superiority is, is key areas, is, is in jeopardy. These factors make it harder for the department to do more with the funding that they do have that instead of reduced competition, that the department has less opportunity to seek price efficiencies. Uncertain budgets, as Jim alluded to, with uh, continuing resolutions that last sometimes as much as six months, lead to inefficiencies that and inefficient programs. Buying things by twos and threes isn't really affordable. All of this will add to greater cost, unit cost, sustainment cost, you name it, and less affordability. The bottom line is that unless the Congress and the administration are willing to make some of the hard political decisions and show political leadership, we will continue down these paths where our country can afford and really get less. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about politics, defense, affordability, sequestration. The, the title is actually a mouthful. I could never get it straight, but it is those topics that we're looking at. And I think you've heard from the other panelists about where we are and where we're headed. I'm not sure I agree with everything that everyone has said, but I think we all do agree, and probably everyone in this room agrees, that sequestration is a terrible way of doing business. It was not supposed to have gone into effect but it is a process that was established in the Budget Control Act, and we are stuck with it at this point. It makes no sense when you're trying to reduce expenditures to go in and cut every program by an equal percentage point. It just is nonsensical, but it is the process by which we are now moving forward. I do think in Washington, D.C., you will see a consensus that we should end sequestration. You see it in the conclusions of the National Defense Panel. You see it in the editorial pages of the Washington Post. You see it in the think tanks. You see it in a lot of the op-eds that are written. And there seems to be general agreement that sequestration should end. And I think there's also some agreement that we should increase defense spending at the same time. So as we look to the new Congress coming back, what is the likelihood that Congress, in fact, will address this issue and will eliminate sequestration? Um, no one really can predict what Congress is going to do, and anyone who says that they know exactly what Congress is to do is either a fool or a liar. I don't want to be seen as either, but I'll proceed nonetheless. Um, it looks to me that the Congress, the new Republican Congress coming in, is probably still going to be control, uh, interested in controlling deficits. That should be what they are looking at. Even though deficits have come down substantially, I do think that is going to be probably first on the agenda. 
While I believe that they would like to increase defense spending, the only way they would do that, I believe, is if there will be an offset. And that offset could be in the form of new taxes, but that seems the most least, the least likely item that the Republicans would turn to in order to pay for an increase in defense spending. Therefore, they will look at domestic spending as a way to offset an increase in defense spending, I believe. As Jim alluded to, the situation on discretionary domestic spending is in pretty dire straits. They, are, they did not start from the same robust funding level before sequestration that defense did. And so therefore, the consequences of living in post-sequestration levels has been pretty tough on our domestic discretionary programs, I think, as Jim pointed out. The question then is, what can we do about entitlement programs to use as a source to pay for an increase in defense spending? And while Jim is correct that you could use the reconciliation process to address that, free up savings and allow that to be used for defense, I have a hard time thinking that you're going to see Democrats support an increase in defense spending paid for with cuts in programs like Social Security and Medicare. It's possible, but I have a hard time seeing that happens. And if the Congress use reconciliation to pass a bill over the objections of Democrats, I have a hard time thinking that the President would sign that bill into law. So as I look forward into where we're headed, I think we're probably stuck with defense sequestration, with sequestration in general. And to be the skunk here in the room, I'm not as worried about that as I sense most people in Washington, D.C. are. If we go back to where we were in fiscal year 12, according to CBO for national defense, which is DOD plus nuclear weapons programs, Department of Energy, and some small national security related programs that are not in DOD, we were at a level of budget authority around $566 billion. This is current dollars. This is not with OCO. This is not constant dollars. It doesn't account for inflation. In fiscal year 13, through sequestration, we came down by about $48 billion to $518 billion. And I think my colleague down here probably still has the scars to show how difficult it was to get down to that level of $518 billion. But from those of us on the outside, when we thought sequestration was going to occur, we thought the consequences would be much more dire to DOD than what was actually, what actually was experienced. Now, if you were a DOD civilian and your pay was cut by 20% for several weeks, that's a pretty serious consequence in terms of implementing sequestration. If you look at what happened in readiness in fiscal year 13, once again, the degradation was very severe. But the modernization world seems to have weathered the storm a little better than we did on the operations side of the house. And I think there's two primary reasons for that. First is a backlog in defense industry that allows some of that shrinkage to be absorbed in drawing down the backlog. And the second is that there is more flexibility inherent in modernization programs that allows you to either defer something or to delete a requirement or to, max or to minimize the cost of something. So that we saw as we implemented sequester in DOD in 2013, Serious consequences, but not nearly as dire as many of us thought was going to uh, occur. Um, turning toward fiscal year 14, we had the Murray Ryan bipartisan budget agreement that provided stability in defense funding for fiscal year 14 and fiscal year 15. I paid careful attention to the vice chief's testimony last year in, in April, or this year in April talking about the readiness concerns that they had and what had happened to readiness in fiscal year 13, and Bob probably knows this a lot better than I do, but it, they said, yes, consequences were very severe. They looked at the Murray-Ryan agreement as allowing them to kind of work their way out of trouble on readiness, not to get back to where they need to get, but they were on a glide path to get back to where they need to get. And while that opinion was not universally shared by the vice chiefs, it seemed to be the majority opinion. In addition to that, as I looked at the Fiscal Year 14 Appropriations Act that the Congress passed, it looked to me like they were trying to address the same problem by readiness, adding readiness funding, by trying to take care and make sure we had a stable modernization program to live within this new level of what in Fiscal Year 14 national defense dollars is $521 billion approximately. As I look at the Fiscal Year 15 appropriations bills that are pending before the Congress right now, I see the same thing. Congress is trying to address a modernization program with stability, and it looks like they will add funding for readiness, maybe as much as $1 to $2 billion, to take care of those last concerns of the vice chiefs to make sure that we, in fact, get readiness back to a stable level. So as we turn to fiscal year 16, and we think about sequestration going into effect again, now if we were facing a 20 or 30 or $40 billion cut below where we were in fiscal year 15, I would agree with everyone that we should, we cannot do that. The consequences would be 
definitely would be dire for fiscal year 16 if we were to face such that type of a reduction. But in reality, I think as the chart has showed you, for national defense, we go from about $521 billion in fiscal year 15 to $523 billion in fiscal year 16. Certainly that is not enough to fully cover the cost of inflation, but in a period of fiscal austerity when we're trying to squeeze every dollar we can out of spending, especially on the discretionary side of the house, it seems to me that defense is actually not that bad off. Furthermore, if we look to fiscal year 17 through 21, as the chart showed, we see defense going up by an amount which is either at inflation or above inflation. So for the foreseeable future, through the BCA cap levels of 21, we're looking at a zero real growth budget for DOD. And from my point of view, when we are, in fact, looking at national debt, we are looking at large def uh, deficits, the fact that defense has a zero real budget growth Frankly, once again, I don't see that as that tragic. Yes, the world is a very dangerous place. Yes, there are threats out there. Yes, be it the Middle East, perhaps Eastern Europe, perhaps South China Seas, West Africa, Horn of Africa, the world is a very dangerous place. But the Congress is authorized to provide additional funding in the form of overseas contingency operations to take care of those overseas threats to take care of emergency, emergent requirements that come up. That is in the law above the BCA caps. So here we are with these relatively tight caps, but we have the ability with a safety net to provide additional funding to take care of whatever emergent requirements uh, pop up on the horizon. And yes, the numbers that we have in a zero real, zero real growth budget do not take into account the CSIS double whammy, nor should they from my point of view. The fact that DOD's costs go up at a rate higher than the rate of inflation means that there is, in fact, waste and inefficiency in the Defense Department. I don't believe we should reward the Defense Department by increasing the budgets to take care of waste and inefficiency. So I've been reading uh, Secretary Gates's book, Duty, and I note that in his book, he talks about a need to get control of the hundreds of billions of dollars in the defense budget that neither DOD nor the Congress exercises adequate oversight of. He says that his deputy, Gordon England, referred to it as a river of money that's flowing through the Pentagon. It's that river of money that we need to get control of. About a year ago, I was here at CSIS on another panel that was talking about rebuilding the consensus for defense spending, and one of the other panelists a former Republican colleague of mine, when addressing the issue of defense spending, he said, you know, we're spending $500 billion a year on defense. Never in my wildest dreams did I expect to see a $500 billion defense budget. And as I walked away from that, I said, you know, he's right. $500 billion is a lot of money to devote to national defense. It's about one third of what the world spends in total on defense. And as I think most people know, it's more than the next eight countries spend combined on national defense. What we need in defense, as Jim alluded to, is we need stability, we need to get out of CRs, we need to get appropriations bills passed. We need then to allow DOD to start planning realistically for a zero real growth budget between now and 2021. No more rosy scenarios that assume that the out years are going to be great so that we, in fact, have enough money to take care of uh, increasing production rates on, on airplane systems that's probably never going to occur, which then leads to higher costs. Those are the types of things that need to be eliminated. We need to have a stable budget. We need to have a stable plan. And at that point, I believe, last and not least, is we need to take Gordon England's river of money and turn it into a stream or at best a trickle so that the funding there is no longer this river of money flowing through the Pentagon that no one has any idea what it's being spent for. Thank you very much. Well, that was refreshing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> During that time, uh, we're now at the stage of taking questions. I think we've had, uh, in addition to the Secretary Works presentation, uh, four very solid presentations at this panel um, that should provide the basis for a stimulating conversation. I encourage people to use the microphones. Uh, in fact, uh, we can't take questions if you don't use a microphone. And please state your name and affiliation as you ask your question. 
Uh, who would like the first question? Hi, George Nicholson, a consultant for Special Operations and Counterterrorism. Clark, the session that you had over at CSIS about two years ago, chaired by Senator Sam Nunn, with 10 former senior uh, Republican and Democratic congressmen and senators, se Secretary of Defense, going down the list. But they came up with a solution set, the national defense and, the, uh, and, uh, uh, and national debt. They said the solution set was threefold. You had to solve entitlements, you had to solve the tax code, and you had to uh, solve uh, entitlements, the tax code, and entitlements. Uh, but again, basically saying it's too hard to handle. What do you all see as the future of getting a handle on it? Well, nothing, in my view, for the next couple of years in terms of broad budget reform. I just don't think it's going to happen until beyond the next presidential election. But it does need to happen. I um, mean, you've, uh, you've heard Jim and others say we, the, the problem is on the, in the entitlement side, principally Medicare, but Social Security is a contributor and, and on the tax side. I just don't see that happening in the next two years. Um, I hope that beyond the next presidential election it will. On the third piece that they talked about was revenues. Right. They need to be they need to be looked at together, entitlements, revenues, and discretionary spending, but especially the former two. I probably want to add to that. Um, I think ultimately if it's not this Congress, it'll be a Congress and a president will do it. They have to do it. If you look at every long-term debt projection that exists everywhere, it and the key here is Medicare, it, it, it bulges in double-digit increases that are not currently accommodated by the current revenue flow. On taxes, I think there's, there's, there's a lot, to, and I'm not a tax expert, but I have two good ears. The tax debate in this town is one where tax experts all agree something ought to be done, that it would stimulate the economy, get you more revenue, do a whole bunch of good things. There's this broad-based division about whether or not we could do it comprehensively, or you would do a business tax proposal first, and then you get around to personals. That is a political uh, a divide in this town that has not yet been bridged. I, 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 my problem is I, I don't know how long we want to remain in this crisis atmosphere on discretionary spending before uh, somebody says, oh, my God, we've got to do something. And I mean, I, I, Bob may be right. This may be the wrong Congress for it, but, but I think you've got to do something. The other problem, the other thing that would concern me is I fear the way we do business in this town, the, the day of the big comprehensive piece of legislation may be behind us. I think now we are uh, incrementalists. We solve pieces of the puzzle piece at a time. We don't go after the big puzzle, whatever the issue is. So it, it, we tend to view progress in this town as some little thing as opposed to a bigger, broader solution. And that, to me, in the short term, is probably what holds you back from getting to the point that Senator Nunn wanted to get you to. You know, I'm much like Charlie in the sense that I don't think there's going to be a deal that emerges on BCA because I think it's going to have to be comprehensive. It has to include not just national security but domestic as well. I think that's going to be the price to get this thing done. And I don't see the political will to be able to, to swallow that. So I think we're going to limp through the next two years. Um, and, um, you know, the sky will not fall. In fact, you know, industry really, really orchestrated a very concerted effort on the Hill to say, hey, you know, don't do sequestration. It's bad policy. It's bad for the Department of Defense. It's bad for everybody. And, um, you know, the sky did not fall. And I think that that was an effort that was well-intentioned, but it now is viewed as maybe we lost some credibility as a result of that. Um, so I think, you know, you've seen a lot of deficit hawks that have, you know, our defense hawks that have turned into deficit hawks. They're not going to remake themselves in the next two years with the 2016 election looming. 
I think that spending is going to be, it's a core value for Republicans. I think that will continue. So I am not optimistic we're going to come up with a deal to avert sequester. And I think it's going to have to be some future administration that deals with this really ticking time bomb on entitlement spending that everyone knows needs to get fixed, but no one knows the recipe on how to do it. And I guess from my point of view, I think everyone probably can figure out that I'm going to say, no, I don't think we're going to get an agreement on um, deficit reduction. Um, through tax reform, you could identify revenues that could be used for additional spending. If there was an agreement that you could take revenues from tax reform and use it to either reduce the deficit or to allow for some growth in spending, and that could be coupled with entitlement reform, which would, in fact, reduce expenditures. There is a way to go forward to reach agreement on that, but we have been working on this since 2011, you know, seriously trying to come up with a way to do that, and Congress has not been able to do it. There just doesn't seem to be an, a, a way to get both sides together on this, and until we end divided government, probably, um, it's hard to see how we would come up with this kind of, a, of an agreement, short of a crisis that occurs that then forces us, forces Congress to say, we have to deal with this issue now. But short of a crisis, I have a feeling we'll continue to kick the can down the road on this issue, taking care of little problems as they arise, but not dealing with the totality of the complex issue. I used to be a big believer in the Herbert Stein rule that if something can't go on forever, it won't. Um, I no longer believe in that rule uh, uh, because evidence is real life has indicated that that's not true. I now believe in another one. Denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Uh, next question. Right there. Hi, good morning. Megan Eckstein with Defense Daily. Um, I have a question for Secretary Hale and whoever else might want to uh, join in. Um, you talk about the need for a higher top line. Um, when you released the FY15 budget, you sort of did a parallel budget with the uh, sequestration level spending as well as a higher president's request level spending, um, presumably to show the trade-offs. Um, I wondered if you thought you got the reaction you expected from Congress. They almost seemed uh, irritated talking about a higher spending level during public hearings. So I just wondered how you thought that approach worked and if you think you'd recommend that the administration do that again for FY16. You know, whether you thought that strategy worked with showing Congress both a sequestration level spending and higher. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I mean, for the last several years, the department has planned two budget levels, and I suspect I'm not there, but they're doing it again. Sorry, 175,000 in the Marines uh, cuts, especially in smaller weapons programs that are necessary for support. Uh, it is not something that I would like to see in this uh, in this environment, in this uh, national security threat environment. So, I think it's the right thing to do. Whether it will convince the United States Congress that they should go to a higher level, I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. But I wouldn't rule it out. I think a mini deal uh, along the. The Murray Ryan lines again. Murray Ryan, as I remember, paid for the increases with some kind of low level increases, and I think they changed some of the IRA rules. I can't remember the details. I could see the possibility of something like that again. I, I don't think it's very likely in the next couple of years we're going to see a broad budget deal. Next question uh, in the back right there. Hi, uh, Scott Massioni with Inside the Pentagon. Uh, this is mostly for Mr. Hale. Uh, I was wondering previously when sequestration was uh, imminent, what kind of uh, operational uh, preparations you made for those cuts and what kind of operational preparations do you think CENTCOM is making now in the fight with ISIL uh, for a possible return for sequestration? 
Well, as sequestration loomed in 2012, I mean, we made a conscious decision in the Department of Defense not to sequester ourselves. We listened to the president who said publicly in the debates the sequester would never happen, to all the key leaders in Congress who said it would never happen, um, and, and decided that we weren't going to do it. Uh, we weren't going to sequester ourselves. So we did not restrain spending in that first quarter of, uh, so it would have been uh, fiscal 13. Um, I, I, that is not the case today. There's a fair amount of restraints on spending, partly because the sequestration itself imposed them, but also because now we know it could happen. So I, I don't think, I mean, I likened it at that time to driving in a wall at 65 miles an hour, figuring you'd, you'd go around the wall, not crash into it. We crashed into it. They won't do that again, and, and they aren't doing it again. So if it, if it happens again, there'll probably be even more modest effects because many of the changes to accommodate it are already in place in the form of reduced readiness, uh, for example, and, and some slowdowns in modernization. And I don't think the, 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 the incremental effects would be as dire as they were in 2013. I just want to add to that. Um, Stanley Kober. I think it was Frederick the Great who advised his generals, he who would defend everything defends nothing. We're reducing spending, continuing to reduce spending, but we still maintain all these commitments. Couldn't help noticing Secretary Work uh, started out by issuing reassurances to everybody. How realistic is that over time? Or should we begin to reconsider our commitments, recognizing that if we try to do everything, we will be too thin to succeed? Uh, well, you, you may have the wrong panel. Work may be a better, uh, better person to do that. You know, it's hard to uh, say to a president, uh, gee, we can't do this, we can't afford it. I think that's not the department's way. Uh, they'll, they'll do their best. And, and, you, and at most you'll, and, and it still is a big budget. I mean, 500 billion is a lot of money. Gates used to say for 500 billion, I'd be able to give him a good defense, but he was also the same guy that argued hard for increases. So uh, uh, I don't think the department, in, I think it will take it a while before it decides to actually come out and say, we can't meet the national security needs of the country. I think it's a question of risk. Defense budgets are, are a question of trading off dollars for risks. They'll accept some higher risk. They're doing it right now. If we, if we went into a major situation today, an Iran and a Korea, for example, we would have serious problems because of the readiness degradations that have been imposed. We are taking some added risk. Let's hope uh, that uh, those, uh, those risks uh, don't come back to haunt us. So I think it'll be a long time before defense says we can't do it. They will accept higher risk. And I think that, just to add to that, Secretary Work made it very clear that while the department will not say no, they will also execute missions at a reduced operational capacity. Think about how long it's taking us to set up the first hospitals in West Africa. Think of the magnitude, I think David Deptula compared it to, uh, to a drizzle rather than a thunderstorm, the current level of the air campaign over Iraq and Syria. There are things that we are doing at reduced levels of capacity that I think in part reflect reduced levels of dollars that go into the readiness of our forces. You know, I would just add when if you think back to the 90s under the Clinton administration, how the Department of Defense was really on a downward spiral, started in the Bush administration, continued through the Clinton administration. And one of the things that we saw was tiered readiness, where units that were late to deploy got less training, got less um, current equipment, less exercises. I think you're already starting to see some of that, um, and that's just the beginning. And then if you think about the acquisition process, how Quantities were reduced, timelines were stretched, 
inadvertently caused on McCurdy's kind of some downward spirals of programs. I think you're going to see more of that. Um, I think you're already starting to see some. But those are the indicators that I think we all look to to see the impact on the force. And so, in fact, you're right. Really, you cannot do everything at the same level. And as new things pop up, something else has to um, pay the price. So it's really a, a shell game in some sense. I would just add to that, and that's true. Uh, th this Congress is, uh, has got to uh, continue, expand, or modify the authorization for the use of military force in Syria and Iraq. And they, they have the potential for a robust debate, but that debate will be about policy. I don't believe it will be about resources. I don't hear anybody talking about whether or not the Congress would not provide the necessary resources once the policy is resolved. So I, I, I think you, you got a little thing coming up at you. Watch the debate on AUMF. See if there is a debate. If there, it, it, it should be interesting if there is, but it, it, I guarantee it won't be much about resources. Hi, uh, Brian Bradley from Nuclear Security and Deterrence Monitor. Um, some experts have said the nuclear enterprise is traditionally a target for defense cuts um, during times of budget constraints. Uh, meanwhile, the Navy and the Air Force um, are working to, um, well, pending in the House and Senate Armed Services Committees is the National Sea-Based Deterrent Fund, and the Air Force has also um, said that it is in discussions on uh, separating another set-aside fund. So my question to the panelists, uh, another set-aside fund for its two legs of the nuclear triad. So my question to the panelists is, um, do you see um, all current uh, plan programs, modernization programs in the nuclear enterprise um, as having good chances of going through? Or do you see um, kind of some as uh, being at risk of, of seeing cuts? Thank you. Well, all those programs will get looked at in a tight budget, but I think there's a pretty strong level of concern over the status of uh, nuclear forces right now and that, that much of the operating budgets and some of the smaller procurements are likely to win support. I mean, we'll have to see. The, the two big issues in the nuclear horizon, one, of course, the follow-on strategic submarine, I think it's got strong support and will go forward. We get into the 2020s, uh, and, we, and assuming that we need to replace the, uh, the missiles, then I think there'll be a more brisk debate uh, over whether that should go forward. But I think for the next few years, because of all the problems we've had, because there is substantial concern, uh, I would assume most of those programs, maybe not all of them, but most of them will win support. Things that I think it's important to remember is that the total size of the nuclear modernization budget is still only about 5% of what the total defense budget is. So the question, again, becomes one of priorities. Any procurement item will be debated in this budgetary climate. The question is, is that what does an administration, what does the Department of Defense declare to be their top priorities? You can protect strategic modernization if you want to. The dollars are there. Uh, back there. Hi, Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. Um, this is more of a hypothetical question, but I'm curious if you see downside scenarios uh, from the BCA levels. If there's another recession in the United States, for example, how well do you think defense is going to hold up in that scenario or environment? Hush your mouth. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really a tough question because if the scenario you outline comes to play, there will be pressure in the Congress for some sort of a stimulus program. Um, I can make the case, and Bob alluded to it earlier, that uh, if you really want to do something along these lines, take a look at the military construction program because it's a good one. And I don't believe, uh, I'll be stand corrected, but I don't believe they did that in the 2009 stimulus. Did they, a little bit? It's very yeah, little. Uh, they, some hospitals. Yeah, a little bit. Um, but I think the issue becomes you, you're faced with a decline in revenues, and the, the, the question between the two parties will be, well, what is an effective stimulus? One will, will argue for changes in the tax code. The other will argue for direct expenditures. Maybe you get a combination of both. 
But uh, I, I don't know. When I think about that, I don't necessarily think that the defense budget would be put at risk in that debate. One last question before this panel concludes at 15 minutes of, um, right here. Thank you very much. Uh, Roman Schweitzer from Guggenheim Securities. I just want to, uh, Secretary Work mentioned uh, sort of a, a controversial issue that occurred earlier this year with the reprogramming. Uh, moving some funds from, you know, to, to buy JSFs and helicopters from O&M, reprogramming O&M funding. Um, certainly Congress uh, uses rescissions in the appropriations process, and certainly there's reprogrammings. If we have OCO continuing for a number of years, do you think that increases or decreases the chance of a deal that might influence uh, investment spending? Does this provide sort of a backdoor gray area for? Well, I think you'll continue to see Reprogramming, you'll continue to see recessions. You'll, you know, if you, this, what we're going to expect to see in the coming years. I would be surprised if there's any change to that. Um, if you look at September, I believe it was, there was a reprogramming that came forward to the Congress using taking funds from O and M and putting into procurement in in the OCO category, and that was denied by the Congress. Primarily because some question whether or not it was an appropriate use of resources to use O and M funds to pay for procurement systems, um, and I do believe that 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 is a type of thing that you're going to see more of in the future. I am concerned that the Congress will, in fact, tighten the flexibility that is allowed under the OCO funding, and that is. I look at this as our safety net that allows us to, in fact, live with the BCA caps and. So from my point of view, that is something that it needs to be, the DOD needs to look at very carefully, um, make sure that the Congress does not come back and, and take away the authorities that are, that are already in existence for that. I, I just want to add, I think Charlie's right. I think the Congress from that particular uh, issue onward will be much more circumspect about what it approves in terms of moving this money. I would also get back on my high horse again about how if, if we could get ourselves in th that elusive butterfly that we all worship, uh, the regular order around here, if we get ourselves to a point where we could get this Congress in a regular flow of producing appropriations bills and conference reports in a timely fashion, I think we can minimize a lot of this stuff because there is this ongoing conversation between the Department and the Congress that is stimulated. And uh, you can handle a lot of these things if you're producing a bill in September as opposed to whether or not you have to move uh, billions around uh, just in a relatively uh, less than transparent way. Let me address the reprogramming issue more broadly than you asked, and, and, and that it is critical uh, to the department's ability to manage change. Uh, it's usually 1% or 2% of the budget. It's, it's, it's always a hard sell in the Congress. But during the darkest days of, of sequestration, they allowed a lot of reprogramming, and it minimized the harm that was done. So it, 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 it's critical, and I, and I think the department recognizes that and, and, and pushes the envelope a little bit, but not so far that, uh, that it would cause the Congress to stop it, because it, it is a key source of flexibility and the department's ability to manage through tough times. Yeah, I would just add that there's always tension about reprogrammings where the Congress views is the department obviously needs flexibility to move money to address emerging requirements needs. But I think what we saw in really this, de this past decade was reprogrammings were used for new starts. And we, at one point we counted the number of new starts and we, it was like shocking. And that means starting new programs, authority to proceed with new programs. And so it was becoming a shortcut from the budget. The budget sort of was not viewed as the way, the appropriate way to do it. Well, let's just put it no-go. So they were just popping up every way. And, and what happens with programs that get started in reprogrammings, it's a little ragged program startup, not as so much oversight. And so I think appropriately the Congress kind of squashed some of that. But then there's always this recognition that the department has to be able to do some of the tough things they're going to do, especially when you're at war. I mean, some of the juons that came up, you have to figure out a good compromise. And it really goes down to trust and relationships about 
doing the right thing. And you know, so maybe you're right. If both sides are unhappy a little bit, that's that's a good solution. I think that um, I'll take the chairman's prerogative for once. Uh, and speaking as a former authorizer, and authorizers so rarely get the last word uh, in any discussion on these matters that I can't help but with a panel that has three former appropriators on it to do it. I think people have underestimated the extent to which OCO is a safety valve for everyone involved in this process. Uh, we have you know, an, an OCO to base problem of 20 to $30 billion per year, that is of functions that should be funded in the base budget, but are in OCO now because it can be funded there, it doesn't count against the budget deficit. I believe that my colleague Ryan Crotty, when he did a, a deep dive into the FY 2015 appropriations bill that is currently winding way, that the appropriators themselves moved about $9 billion out of the base budget into OCO in order to make room in the budget for priorities that weren't being funded by the Department of Defense, but the appropriators wanted to fund. I mean, OCO is a huge safety valve. The reason why we're living with the unsustainable Budget Control Act is because of OCO. You know, it's the crack cocaine of defense budgeting to some extent. So um, there's been a lack of discipline in the process. And I think that the two of my colleagues have mentioned that if Congress tightens up on OCO, that is going to really increase the pressure on all of the participants involved. So um, please join me in thanking the panel for a great job. And we're now adjourned.